It's very easy to forget that in the US, HIV was a disease with a death sentence. Fairly recently, HIV was a disease with a death sentence. Um, today, just 39,000, roughly 39,000, 49,000 people are diagnosed with HIV in the United States every year, um, but there are 1.2 million people living largely healthily with the disease. So there's a lot of progress to be made, but there's a lot of work left to be done as well. Um, Dr. Havler, you worked on one of the first AIDS wards in the United States, or the first AIDS wards in the United States, um, and you eventually launched Getting to Zero in San Francisco, which is an incredible program with incredible results. So can you tell the room a little bit about that? We're gonna start with the successes. Okay, sure. Well, as mentioned, where we've been in HIV, we didn't know what caused it, we didn't know how to treat it, we didn't know how to prevent it. Now we know all three of those things. And we've gone from a very grim time to a very optimistic time. And really my mission is my goal, I love to talk about goals, is really to end the AIDS epidemic. And one of the ways we can start doing that by is by finding everyone who's infected, offering them treatment, and people who are at risk offer also offering preventative treatment, which you heard a little bit about this new exciting technology, but still right now we have a pill. So a couple of years ago, we were having a panel just like this, only it would have been like HIV Health in San Francisco at the LGBT Center. We brought all these cool things, self-testing, and we were talking. And I want to emphasize this point of how we launched our Getting to Zero initiative. Somebody was sitting in the front row, one of the, someone living with HIV in San Francisco, and raised his hand and said, this is cool, but are you guys all working together? And what we realized, we were not working together enough as we should have, and what we from that point on was we launched an initiative with the politicians, the private sector, the academicians, the people living with HIV, and the government officials, and we used the principle of collective impact, and we said we need to work together, all doing what we're supposed to do in order to reduce the number of HIV infections in San Francisco. So that's what we're doing now. We're starting to see reductions in HIV infections, and we have a three-pronged approach, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, but it all started from looking at the disease from the patient's perspective. Right, talking about real humans. And we will talk a little bit more detail about what it is you've done and how it can possibly scale elsewhere. Um, you know, one way, obviously, to limit the spread of HIV is through programs like this that literally limit the spread from one person to another. There's another way to attack the HIV virus, which is to try to come up with a vaccine that prevents the transmission in the first place. Um, Dr. Corey, you've been at the front lines for a long time as well, working on drug development and, and even vaccines. Um, and you've said that for all the progress we've made, we can't treat our way out of this epidemic. So how far are we from a vaccine? Well, cautiously optimistic. Um, uh, I think we're um, at a wonderful sort of a, I'll call it the Yogi Berra moment in, the, in HIV vaccine development. We're in a fork in the road and we're taking it. Um, uh, we have had um, this is conceptual um, ability to, that, to say that an HIV vaccine is possible. There was a study that was done uh, in Thailand that had a, overall about a 30% efficacy. It's about 60% in the first year that then waned over time. Um, and we've um, developed a number of public-private partnerships um, uh, funded between the NIH, the Gates Foundation, and private industry because that's where manufacturing is to, um, to essentially build on that, construct vaccines um, that will, um, we think, develop in a higher titer the kinds of antibodies, what we call non-neutralizing antibodies, that we think were the factor in the partial efficacy in the, what we call the Thai trial, the RV144 trial. And those trials are actually just starting underway, um, um, one of them in South Africa and one of them um, sort of in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are really sort of, um, sort of fixed into that area of being able to sort of evaluate whether this idea and can we improve upon this idea. Most vaccines are made by neutralizing antibodies. We haven't been able to make neutralizing antibodies to HIV. Um, that's a complicated issue, but the sugars and the construction of the virus uh, have made that very difficult. Um, uh, so, but we have made enormous technological uh, advances in isolating broadly neutralizing antibodies, manufacturing them, and giving them 
Um, and we have a, a very large study that is uh, ongoing and is really enrolling incredibly well. 1,500 women in, in uh, Africa are getting an IV medication every two months. It's not that we think that IV medication will actually do this, but it's, it's a concept study to define uh, what levels of neutralization will prevent uh, infection, and can we make a vaccine, or can we make antibodies that could be delivered by this prior technology or by subcut subcutaneous in, uh, involvement. So we have these two approaches, and um, we, we do feel, um, actually, like I say, quite optimistic that, that we will be able to do something here. I know one thing that scientists don't like doing that I'm going to ask you to do anyway is uh, cast forward. How, how far off is this? How far off is the vaccine? Well, I think the efficacy trials that we'll look at, one will come in at two, in uh, April of 2019, the other one uh, will come in in um, April of 2020, and one the other one in 2021. Awesome. So we really have um, uh, sort of 19, 20, and 21 will actually sort of tell us, reset the field and tell us just how close we are. It's an astounding time of progress. Um, back to your work in, in San Francisco, Dr. Havler. It's very, uh, one thing about, about what you're doing there is it's very labor intensive, right? It, it requires a lot of people, it requires a lot of investment, it requires a lot of cooperation, um, tracking patients, in, in encouraging them compliance, finding them if they're not compliant, if they're not taking their meds. Um, how scalable is that? Um, there are still hot spots in the United States where HIV is going up. It's not going down. So what will it take to get that kind of incredible program sort of done at scale? Well, there's three pillars of our program. The first one is to scale up PrEP. We do have a pill you can take once a day, and it protects you 96% against getting HIV infection. We're doing all sorts of innovative things, which are not even labor intensive, like having pharmacy dispense the PrEP and having other places dispense PrEP. Something that doesn't cost any money that we're doing that could have a big impact that cities around the world have come to us to learn about, which seems like such a simple concept is, as soon as you get an HIV diagnosis, you start on treatment that day. Before, it was like everyone's wringing their hands. Oh, how do you feel about it? I'm not saying that we are not sympathetic. I'm a doctor. I'm very empathetic and sympathetic. But it's time to get on it and start treatment. When people have a heart attack, they don't say, well, how are you feeling about taking medicines for the rest of your life? Do you think you could possibly do that? So we have testing sites all over the city. We have people get on an Uber, they come over to places that can start therapy, and we start therapy that day. That is not expensive, and that is completely exportable, and now is being do done around the country. I think what you're referring to is people, no matter what disease you have, it's hard for them to take medicines, and we're putting effort in defining them. The thing with HIV is, if you stop your treatment, your viral load in days to weeks is going to shoot up to a million copies in a teaspoon of blood. You're highly transmissible. It's very different than hypertension or some other diseases. Right. So we have to figure out cost effective, cost efficient. But something we've done with HIV to think about with other diseases, we're doing quality improvement at a, like an overall city level. Hospitals think about doing it within their silos. But by us working together, we're improving things. One of the things we were talking about earlier, Dr. Corey, and I think Dr. Havler, you'll have insight on this as well, is there's a persistent stigma around HIV that you think would be gone by now, but it, but it isn't. Um, are there any sort of innovative campaigns or programs or, or ways of talking about the disease that, that can fight that? I think we've made great progress um, with respect to that, but, but there is stigma with a lot of diseases. Um, I mean, certainly every sexually transmitted disease, and uh, in the, even in the high prevalence countries of, of uh, South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, where, you know, 30% of women by the time they're 35 have HIV, HIV infection, um, uh, there is the, this reluctance to talk about sexual acquisition uh, and um, how to destigmatize it. Um, uh, some tools, some technological tools like, you know, self-testing, point-of-care testing, uh, talking about it. Um, you know, all those things sort of make inroads. Mm -hmm. um, but there is um, sort of a, a human nature that one sees cross-culturally about uh, sexual transmission, empowerment, um, especially between of women, um, that are really very difficult to, to overcome and are sort of present in an enormous number of cultures. Right. You know, I, that's a tough question. I think when, when people ask me, why is HIV still a problem? The virus is smart. My number two is stigma and shame, and they go hand in hand. Right. And even in San Francisco, arguably the place we've had the most education, 
one of the first questions people ask us or say to us, one, am I going to die? Don't tell my family. And what we found out actually by offering them treatment when we share this information, we had a young man the other day where he found out he was infected, he called his mom up, he was 21 years old, and he said, Mom, I need to tell you I'm HIV infected, but don't worry, I started treatment today. And there was something liberating about him saying that he was doing something about this disease. And we have a long ways to go in stigma, but I think we are making some progress. That's great. Um, Dr. Havler, we have a room full of you know, tech geniuses here, people from the business world and people from the tech world. Um, and one thing is that, that hasn't really been largely disrupted so far is HIV, but you were telling me about this machine learning that you have going on in, in, in Africa. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I think there are, I love the question from my sister who said about equity. Um, I do a lot of work in very rural areas in sub-Saharan Africa that are affected by HIV. There, are so, there is so much opportunity for applications in tech in, in Africa right now. So they skip the whole landline, everything cell phone, finance, everything is, is and almost all people have access to cell phones. So there are many things we can do with technology. AI, we shouldn't consider AI something that's just used in developed countries. One of the things we're working on right now is to get countries to buy in to hire 2 million community health workers in Africa. Maybe somehow we could connect some algorithms, some AI thinking to make those workers make better health decisions, help them out, and even deal with things like corruption. We just shouldn't even think about health. We should think about political science and policy about how we can link that. And then I was mentioning that it's, it's, we're really trying hard because we can prevent HIV to identify people at most risk. In an ongoing project that we have, what we're doing is we're collecting all these variables and we're doing machine learning to identify people based on who we know in this area, in this population of 320,000 people have zero converted within the last two years, who is likely again to zero convert and we can offer them PrEP. And it's not as if we, we would do machine learning in every community, but if we apply that and understand diseases more, then we can come up with probably simple epidemiologic factors that help us target interventions. So many, many different ways and opportunities for tech. Um, one thing we know about infectious diseases, be it the flu or Ebola or HIV, is that they, they don't go away on their own. Um, when you're fighting them, you have to fight nonstop. Um, and you can't fight for four years and then drop it because your funding disappears. Um, so one thing that you know, I think about a lot and that comes up a lot in these conversations is you know, the threats to a persistent global HIV response. We've made all of this progress. Um, what is it going to take casting forward to make sure that your trials get finished and that the follow-up work gets funded? Well, I like, you know, for sure HIV is the epidemic of uh, our time. Um, you know, we still have 1.4 million infections globally. We still have in our country 45,000 new infections globally. And I think to some extent the healthcare of our generation um, is going to be defined by how we handle the, this epidemic. Um, uh, how, how and, you know, we're starting to get 25 million people on, on therapy and some of the issues is will we provide the technologies to actually um, prevent the acquisition of this? Um, and actually even get close to, to me, what I define as an AIDS-free generation, which is for the United States would be less than 1,000 cases a year and for the world to be less than 100,000 cases a year, which is essentially a 90% reduction in, in where we are now. Right. Now, I don't think that is going to happen um, unless we have a vaccine or unless we have a long-acting biological. Um, that the issue of taking a pill every day for a disease to prevent a disease um, is really something that, you know, is fraught with, with compliance issues. And I think, you know, you can take a country like South Africa, which is the largest HIV uh, treatment program on the world, and it now has, you know, eight or nine pe million people on treatment. But the incidence of the epidemic, especially among women, has not been dented at all in the five years. Now they've changed life expectancy incredibly. So um, I really do believe that, you know, we are going to be defined by our ability to actually develop um, uh, a technology that allows um, people to prevent this infection. And I sort of feel that a way um, as it relates to all, you know, essentially all epidemic diseases. I mean, HIV, our, our platform has, has led the way so that we can develop Zika vaccines and Ebola vaccines, uh, the DNA, the MVA, the, the whole vector platforms upon which these 
um, uh, vaccines to, to Zika and Ebola, which are, are a, have worked and are very likely to work. Zika is not going to be a hard uh, virus to make a vaccine for. All were tested through the HIV vaccine program. They all came into to, to this through that way. So I do believe that technology um, is, is critical. Um, we need to use it. And I think we as a society will be defined on how we bring these technologies to improve the health of mankind. And what will, what, will be, what will be required in order to, to pull that off? Because one could say, you know, we have the technology yeah. to create a Zika vaccine, but yeah, we don't commitment. have one yet. Um, I, I did a program with, with Vice, and not that I certainly, I didn't vote for George W. Bush, but he did do PEPFAR, and he looked at the issue of the funding, and he says, now's not the time to take the foot off the gas. Right. You know, we've made an enormous amount of progress. Um, in this program, both in a therapy point of view and a prevention point of view, and, and we need sustained commitment. And I, and, um, uh, I think it's, it's going to require public-private par partnerships. You know, we love to think we, we can do things in academia, but we can't manufacture a damn thing. Um, and what companies do is they democratize therapies. Um, and we need that expertise from companies. Yes, we recognize that we're in a high-risk business, and it's the public that's going to gain the most. And so public funding and philanthropic funding is actually needed for these kinds of diseases. But we must engage industry. We must engage the latest in technologies, and we've got to develop disruptive technologies to deliver antibodies, if it's the antibody approach, to, so we can make it at $5 a gram, not at $100 a gram. Um, and I actually think that'll disrupt um, the the antibody productions for the diseases that are costing a huge amount of money, you know, for the anti-cancer antibodies and, and other things when you come up with manufacturing techniques that, that really allow, you know, to cut the cost of goods by, you know, um, tenfold. Right. Do you have anything? Maybe to just three things. Invest in research. Invest in care. We know things work. As we say, either we pay now or pay later because new infections are driving the epidemic. And then the third thing, which we've really learned, is talk to the community. I, communities, we can, we can end the AIDS epidemic, but the community's gonna need to want to. And all this, people can't take therapy for years and years. Yes, they can. In this place we're working, we've achieved, we've exceeded. 90% of the people know they're infected. Over 90% are taking meds, and 90% have been taking them for years and have suppressed their virus. But it's because they wanted to do it. And one of the things, they told us how. One of the big challenges in HIV, nearly half the people on the planet don't even know they have it. But the communities we work with said, don't just do HIV testing. Tell us if we have diabetes. Tell us if we have high blood pressure. We're like, oh, we can do that. That's no problem. So we have to, I think, also listen a little bit more when we tackle these big problems. Yeah, the, the African communities, uh, they are social communities, and it's a social, social group. There's much more groupness and decision-making in, uh, in, in how they live than our highly individualistic uh, society. I think HIV has also um, helped the healthcare system. I mean, tiered pricing exists because of HIV, what the Clinton Foundation, what everybody did with respect to bringing um, drugs to, to um, uh, the developing world. That, uh, that whole model is there. Um, I wish the cancer business uh, actually followed that model. <laughs> Fair enough. Before we wrap, I'm going to go to the floor, and if there's a question. All right. Thanks. Hi, I'm Brian Walsh with Time. Do you have any concerns about how the, the impact the current administration might have on both these efforts, whether it's getting to zero or whether it's support for the, you know, the level of scientific funding you'll need for the research into an HIV vaccine? Yes. Stop. Uh, I would just like to say also that um, HIV is a disease where we've really benefited from bipartisan support. And I think that it's, it's been an example of um, one of the areas in our country that's been very functional. And arguably, antiretroviral therapy is one of the greatest successes in modern medicine. We would not be where we would right now with this epidemic um, if it weren't for that. Great. Thank you both so much. Yeah. Thank you.